So my first question is, what is your style of art? Uh, what is my style of art? Yeah. Uh, gosh, I mean, I don't know. I've never been asked what style. I guess what medium of yeah. work that I make in is normally what people ask. Uh, and it, I guess it really depends on what uh, what I'm making it about. So depending on the work, I think choosing the right medium is pretty important uh, because part of the medium also tells the uh, tells exactly what the thing is. So in the past, I've worked with things like uh, I've also worked with a uh, pulse laser holography because I wanted it to be a medium that was both futuristic but also stuck in history in a bit, you know, because. That medium is something that has never really progressed since the 80s, but uh, you know it's in the 80s and 90s. But you know, but you know it's uh, it's always futuristic. So I think choosing the medium for the work is important. Yeah. Sure. So where do you get your inspiration from? Mm, definitely from just everyday things, or even the boring things. Yeah, the most boring things. Uh, obviously, also the city because. That's where I live. So obviously, everything I make has been about a lot of it's been about Singapore, uh, about uh, well, about our places, really. Yeah. Okay, so it's right for me to say that your life reflects a lot on your daily work. Definitely, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so this is one of your artworks. So, what is the process of creating the map without buildings? Oh, map without buildings. Yeah. Well, uh, the map without buildings. That whole series was actually. Uh, you know, a series of kind of map studies done by hand. But actually, before that, I had been making a book called Dream Syntax that had uh, all the maps of my dreams uh, that were kind of mapped out because it's much more, I thought, as you know, someone more visual, that I, I find it more useful to draw the map when you have a dream uh, and to have it in a, in a pictorial form. But uh, when I showed this kind of book to friends who, who stay in the UK, uh, I had a friend who told me it's kind of weird, all my dreams have buildings in them. They're all set inside buildings or buildings are all around it and there's no like empty field you know that people have dreams of. So I decided I needed to try to think of these empty spaces and how like, how the how these outdoor spaces look like kind of drawing a kind of series of drawings that were kind of set outside you know rather than with all the buildings where I live. Yeah. So what do you want your viewer to take back from, from mm. the artwork? I gotta say, I don't, I don't always make it with the viewer in mind first. I think of what I want to make, then it comes into the world because, you know, I, I want to make, I want to, I want to make that. Uh, it has to be something quite personal. So I, I, I made it first as maps, you know, thinking of them as a bit like mapping out an imaginary kind of space, you know. But they're also kind of tied loosely to the places that I have been doing work in as well. Uh, so and especially overseas, you know, where you stay in a place that's totally different from Singapore, you know, uh, and kind of. All the landscapes, you know, and trying to get that reflected in the the, the, the work the, the work that I make. So, uh, what emotions was soft wall um, shroom reflected? Like supposed to be? Hmm. That one was a very fast experiment, actually. That one was something I guess made because uh, Sin and Luca were having their thing a thing. So I said, I will make this for fun. So I just made it for fun. Uh, a kind of a weird kind of weird pink room for them that was modelled loosely after their studio but I guess that kind of experiment it's just a quick experiment you know making it in blender made it in 3D and putting it together as a little page that they could all view you know on a Google Cardboard uh, those are kind of maybe where my what I do as a in design or as an interaction designer is a crossover yeah because that was just like a quite a fun experiment to make you know and just put together so you did uh, artwork based on illustrations for commuting readers. So ah, yeah. what was the brief given to you for that? Hmm. That they actually asked me whether I wanted to draw if I could draw something that was you know that that had something about uh, you know reading s- Singapore books, but also on public transport. Since these were meant to be small books that uh, would have an easy link card in them or something, they could just zap the whole book together. Uh, so it has been loosely themed around that, but also then I guess think about I was thinking more about my, uh, you know, my experience going to the library. In fact, it's funny because I'm staring at the library over there. The library is right there, library building. But you know, the going to the library, you know, getting library books out, you know, that that kind of nice, peaceful kind of afternoon 
slash night, you know, and this. Uh, so all the drawings were meant to kind of reflect that. I don't know. It became too obvious in the end. The drawings, probably myself. Yeah. So, um, what was your purpose of architectural desires? Hmm. Archite- architectural desires. That that one began as a series of t- texts I was writing in the beginning, uh, before I made it into a video. Um, but uh, I wanted to write. I don't know why it came out stories at the first. At the beginning, it was like all these stories of these ridiculous rules uh, for a city that um, kind of uh, I wanted to 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 think of. You know, like uh, that would make cl- clear the kind of design. You know, when people live in the city, maybe they have some things they wish that they had that don't come come true. You know, and these rules were meant to you know change the way that they behaved in the city. Uh, so I wrote these stories A number of stories That were all focused around Thinking of what What these Interesting rules Would be like uh, It was also Kind of inspired From uh, Paul Sherbert's uh, The Grey Cloth And 10% White Which was a Sci-fi novel Written More than 100 years ago Actually About glass architecture So there is a There's a character In it Who uh, Who You know Who dis- who who actually uh, who who makes a comment about how uh, that uh, the person is asking someone else what was the I can find the quote actually the exact quote but basically there was someone asking someone about oh, don't you want to eat oysters and uh, the person said no but I thought you would um, instead of just talking about oysters I thought you would express something about the uh, you know your architectural desires so in the novel there is a character who's consumed by architecture by glass architecture. And expects everything to to revolve around it, including he wants his wife to wear a dress that's grey so that it complements the architecture of the glass buildings he has built. And the whole novel is about that, you know. And the lady who is like, uh, who has agreed to marry him, and what what you know whether she sticks with it and what she makes of this ridiculous um, demand that everything should bow to. Uh, the architect's uh, dream that everything must complement uh, the aesthetics of it. So, I want, that's, that's where the idea of the rules come from. And that's why I wanted to... I actually made them as a bunch of stories, but a bit more about Singapore, obviously. So I suppose also when I wrote it, I was, uh, I was in Berlin. So, I, I thought of Singapore. It, it, for some reason, I kept thinking of Singapore as well. Because Berlin is a lot more free, easygoing, cycle-friendly. Very different from Singapore. Uh, and you know it was very it, it's very different even the, it was Berlin in the summertime you know com- people sit everywhere in the grass here people are like not, they're not sitting in the grass covered in ants you know uh, so it's a very different experience you get in different cities so it was a series of stories that um, some of them got translated into video work and other kind of other works along the way yeah so I think I made a video a video of a Someone of, of a hand touching a wall and making this ridiculous ASMR kind of folly sound. Yeah, in the end. That, yeah, uh, I would say actually I, had, uh, I, I made a video then and it was all shot in Berlin. But I, I haven't actually, I actually shot more footage, a lot more footage in London. I didn't actually, I didn't really exhibit yet. Yeah. So uh, since you stayed about Singapore, so what emotional connection do you feel with Singapore and your artworks? Hmm. I think obviously since I'm also still back in Singapore now, I think uh, everything is a a lot of what is about Singapore. Although I'm, I don't want to say that everything is consumed by it. You know, obviously you have to come from a place. So wherever you come, there is always that context of how the work is made. From my perspective, as a, someone who lives in Singapore and, and also grew up here, yeah. You did an installation based on Singapore River, so we actually missed to watch the installation. So we want to know more about that. Yeah. Artwork. I think uh, the Singapore River shows were probably in 2010, so yeah. that's quite some time back. Yeah, uh, and I didn't. The first time I showed it, I didn't always say it was Debbie. You know my name. I said it was. It was made by the Singapore Psychogeographical Society. I thought I would try to become a neutral party. Not that it's possible to be a truly neutral party as an artist, but uh, I tried to anyway in the beginning. Uh, I guess in the beginning I wanted it to be about the narratives around the Singapore River um, I know this you know, on hindsight now you know having things like the Singapore Memory Project you know along the way it looks like a memory project but at the time when I made it, it was before all this kind of 
memory, big institutional memory projects. Uh, I think I always wanted it to be about even the fictional or the badly remembered or bad memories, you know, where it's not clear if they're the ones that are, uh, no, just remember, you remembered it wrong, it was all fabrication, or, you know, if it was a... Uh, uh, something that was unhappy you know people don't like to recall it so you don't get that in a memory projects often so i wanted it to be about these stories that could also be confabulations yeah so collecting all the stories and kind of archiving them so that was the kind of a that was the that was a project i did called here the here the river lies yeah so is there a particular code you have like a, a model and advice <gasps> yeah oh, an advice or not a quote yeah, quote yeah. Oh no. Something, an advice for like young artists like us uh, who want to pursue new media art. Oh, uh, 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 <laughs> I, I can't, oh, this is too much pressure. Uh, quote. I, I think for, for me, uh, I think especially if you like to work with new kind of with technology, I think you have to, uh, whether, you, whether you're an artist or designer, you have to be open to learning a lot of new skills and trying out a lot of things that don't necessarily work. Maybe even celebrating the kind of glitchy part of technology, you know. So I, I would say that uh, often, you know, because I, I, I work both as a, I teach design, I teach interaction design currently, but I, I also work as an artist. And the difference between the two is that as an artist, no, as a, as a designer, you know, your goal is to say, I've closed that gap of uh, understanding, you know, that between uh, the thing and what you say thing is. But, you know, uh, obviously, in, as an artist, it's about exploring that gap, you know, maybe even showing that, that gap between what, what a thing is and what, you th- what you're going to say, what, what people are going to perceive it as is, is really wider than you. Uh, it's, it's, always, it's hard to remove this gap. It's always going to be there. Yeah.